why not? Let's go check it out, Stephen. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Chiu. Thank you for tuning in. This is Basket Starfish, our language core. This week, I'm going to continue talking a little bit about the H, H as a sound, the very light H, or H as a very heavy rope sound and the shape of H actually came from a rope as I said uh, I will continue what I finished uh, what I didn't finish last week and uh, but before I do that let's start with the usual opening um, slideshow and uh, the show uh, of this uh, of what I'm doing is uh, more than 30 years of my traveling experience and out of that 20 years more than 20 years I concentrate on the search in the um, origin of the uh, common language that we used to spoke the picture you just saw is, was the basket starfish and because I believe that we all share one common core that all the languages we speak are actually related since a long time ago and the uh, languages are not in family tree like thing and it is actually uh, like a basket starfish we all come out from the same core so no one is above uh, the other so I hope that we can change a little bit of how we look at each other and then we are all in equal ground and as a female I actually um, have a different point of view in um, different things. So uh, in this research, I'm, I'm showing you uh, what the uh, scholars fail to look at. And I travel from place to place to very remote places. And then uh, what I see is a little bit different. So I think if you have seen a few of my programs, you will see how I approach, you know, uh, all the alphabets, all the writing actually come from real objects. So uh, connection actually comes in real life you know it's not just a linear link you know like the etymology that the linguist always gave you nothing is linear everything is intertwined like the branches of this uh, basket starfish so um, now I'm going to start with this week's slides um, okay so here you go Okay, so last week I was talking about uh, the very light uh, H sound as speech, as a lot of things coming out from the mouth. And uh, I was going to make a joke about the Alexa. And first of all, the Alexa itself, you know, the word, the first A is actually coming from the very strong bull power. And then the, the car, the soul, and it's more a male uh, element. And the other A at the end, you know, as you know, from the Greek onwards, the A, uh, also the Latin, the A is come, tend to be a very female female ending of any word but it has a very very long history because it always represents the female energy and from the very beginning they use a bird to show those R sound and even today you know in very vulgar words people always refer women to a bird to a chick and that's the reason why you know uh, it, it came down it has a long long history from ancient time and first of all uh, how uh, can you understand this Alexa thing? The Alexa box is actually called Echo, and I will show you by using very, very ancient writing. The Sumerian used this sign like A or E to represent speak or to say something. The Chinese have this Hey sound, you know, to represent also air coming out from the mouth. And then the Greek actually combined the two together, Ihe or Ihos, to mean sound or the noise. And of course, you know, when it transcribed into English, it become like this. And in English, you change the sound to Ikos, and that's how you get the, the, the word echo, you know. Okay, so um, the uh, even the word echo has a long, long history. You can see it's already a complex word, you know, taking part of the element from the uh, Sumerian and also the Chinese. And then uh, this is an intelligence voice recognition. And very interestingly, as I keep saying that, you know, it seems that from the Bible, God started to create by just saying or by the spirit of the of God, you know, moving over the, the water. And so it is always a airy presence. And, the, and there's 
there's a very clear passage that uh, God, to said, God said to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So uh, I think human beings uh, have always tried to become that, especially in modern technology, especially this cloud-based intelligence, everything, you know, coming from a voice, and we try to make uh, a machine obey our own voice. You know, this is a little picture that I drew many, many years ago. You know, it actually suits it because it's a cloud-based God sitting on the cloud. And then is this really God? And then he's by speaking, and then he can make things happen. So we are all trying to mimic God. You know, we are trying to do anything by the voice itself. So, but uh, have we ever give it a deeper thought? Who's really giving the order, or who's really following the order? This is the question that I want you to think about this week. And for example, this is you. You think you give a voice, and then the Alexa will follow your order and listen to you but in order to keep all these gadgets you know you actually have to listen to someone else's voice you cannot afford to lose your job you need to keep all these gadgets and sometimes I think it's very interesting all these gadgets can only do is just to dim the light close the door this is a very simple thing that we can always do it very easily. I learned this lesson myself. One time, you know, I was uh, knocked down by a, a, ran over by a bus. So I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. So after all this time, you know, and, and I was half a year on a crutch. So you can imagine how frustrated I am. So every a single time now when I have to walk, I never wanted or dare to complain because if I can walk to do something I think it's almost like a blessing but in the other way we keep wanting now just to make a voice and make something do something to us for us without we us moving so this circle goes on and on whatever uh, whoever do something uh, whoever under us you know also want to keep the gadget they also listen to to their boss and then so on and on uh, another god has, has another slave to help and that slave is also another god to another slave so it come on and on on and on like that so on the other side it also goes you know uh, endlessly and this is to the other side you know that your boss has to listen to another boss and that boss has also ha has to listen to another boss so I want you to think that um, who is the really the master are we really the master of, of ourselves or are we are giving up our power as a human being to those machines and we also give up to pay a lot of the tension to our surrounding so we can just ask the machine to tell us what is really going on is this what our responsibility as a human being can we really enjoy life that way and and are we really are we all become slaves just by giving up our power as a human being so i want you to think about that so now i will go back to the, this week's uh, talk about the the h sound and x shape h sound is a the light edge is always an empty haze uh, thing. This is Ugaritic, this is Chinese, this is Arabic, and this is Georgian. All of them were used to uh, in uh, words to mean air, and it always has the sound he like this, the light edge. Okay, and uh, if you look at it, uh, the ancient already notice a lot of thing in ancient time of course you know the common thing between this itch and that itch the rope is always this twisting motion and you will see that you know the ancient of course they already know the hurricane or also the typhoon whatever you call it and I will I have just list out a bunch of words so you can pay attention whenever you see this helium haze hello I mean halo his hurricane how when you say hey you know when you call someone or when you holler when you say hi hello and when you're happy when you say ha 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 all this are air coming out from your mouth so actually all these things is uh, 
uh, something empty, you know? So that's why in English you see the sign, the H right there is actually a visual symbol there because otherwise S-I-G-N will be another meaning sign, okay? So you can actually see that in English there are also a lot of uh, visual clues for you to know that what the word is all about. So it goes to hose, which is something empty, hollow, and even a hole. So all this part is about haze and, and something airy. Okay, but today I'm going to concentrate on the root thing. From Sumerian, they already have symbols like this. It actually also carry the H sound. It has something to do, a lot to do with weaving and the trailing of the thread. And you can look at it this way. And here it comes. This one is a old, old uh, Hungarian runic. It is also an H alphabet. This is a he um, in Greek. And this is her in ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. This is high in Chinese, which actually you can see clearly is a rope and, and you can understand everything as some a trolling motion. And then the Sumerian actually goes two direction and they have another uh, rope-like thing, which really means a rope. And of course the ancient Phoenician and ancient Hebrew adopted the form, become like this, and which the, the, the Greek and the Latin become adopted this age form until this very day so you can be sure that whenever you see this H is everything to do with either a rope or something tied or and, and you will see and you will see that this twisting motion even the helix itself and of course you know the umbilical cord is also go in this way so as you can see here because um this are uh, the ancient i mean the greek will use this you know to mean hair height is their word for hair okay or the mane of a horse okay you see this hay the hang or the verb hang and also this helium and helium this has a lot to do with fertility the umbilical cord and this the air this is a very interesting word because it seems that it doesn't pronounce the H but the H there is just like the other sign right there the H is right there for visual purpose to let you know that it's something about the the rope you know for in this case it's the umbilical cord itself and this heritage hug is about two things uh, try and trying together and the helix and I show you a Latin word this is at uh, at so Herrera. So, uh, but they seem not to the revive Latin. They said that they don't pronounce the H sound, but I really doubt it because if you pronounce this hai there, it go, go side by side with all this Chinese hai and also the uh, Egyptian hat and all the Hebrew and, and Arabic height is also the rope itself, something to twine together. So you see the English word inherent, coherent, Hetero, hybrid is something bind together, and the chimera right there. Of course, in English, you begin to change it. Someone, uh, sometimes people uh, uh, read it as chimera, but this should be actually chimera right there, and chalate, chime, and also chaliver. And, and you will see that the English translate ch from Hebrew, and whenever there is a ch sound, and whenever there's a ch sound in Arabic, they will uh, transcribe it as kh. But basically, they are all the ch heavy h sound. It always has to do with the rope. For the khalifa, or the English now, they change it to khalife. It's something to do with the successor of the Prophet Muhammad. So you can always go back to this umbilical cord or a rope that ties to everything. Okay. So I'll show you this. Chinese actually have the worm right there, like a bow with the splitting coming out. We call it as hing, just like the Arab saying ahi or ahu. This is all brothers. So whoever is linked together is brotherhood. So you will see that no matter how we write it, it's always the thread that links to your brotherhood. Okay, so again, of course, this heritage, hegemony, hegemony, or however you pronounce it, 
it are all related to this. Again, I will show you the Chinese. This is Hai means lineage, something related to you or the set descendant. And sometimes the sound changes, but you will see it very clearly the, that they always hold on to the rope. This is all your descendant, okay? And, and then uh, the Chinese also have all these words, something tied to you. It means uh, it uh, shows your belonging, something tied to you, your possession. Sometimes it means slaves, and it also explains why the English word haitera, I mean, it should be the Greek word. Haitera is also, you know, the slave, you know, in ancient time. Um, the hieroglyph now have this. And you understand it. And then the Greek has two words that you have to pay attention to. Whenever you see the Greek, this he right there, or they use this uh, kind of the form now, and it seems that, it, you know, it is an airy H, and then the, it be, I will show you one word is Echein, Echein. Can you see the X right there? It exactly means to have, to hold the ownership, exactly like the Chinese Hai right there. So from now on, whenever you see if it's written in Greek, either it has this sign or it has this sign right there, it always means something, you know, related, you know, something tied to. So um, I'll show you something, you know, I traveled in Yemen and then this is something, uh, this is a an area called Tihama. This is a strip between the Red Sea and, and across the Red Sea from Egypt. So the thing is that it's very, very interesting. It seems that it has a lot of influence from both sides, from the, from India and also from Egypt. And you will see that the thread is a lot, a very, very, very common uh, motive in there. This is very common motive, and this is in the south in Tihama. I will show you also this. This is also very common in all the mosques in the northern part of um, Yemen and you will see that this is um, this twisting sign and you will see that even though you think it is a start of David but actually this is uh, an, an Arabic uh, heritage because you will see that this is Allah right there and there is a word hey right there hey actually in Arabic means you know this part of Arabic uh, Arab country I mean it actually means to live long and as you can see to live long is actually after the copulation of the two triangle you will see the rope keep coming down intertwining with each other just like the starfish I show you and then the rope keep coming down and if you look at across the Red Sea to the other side the, 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 the ancient Egyptian they have this is high and then they also have this as a he actually means uh, eternity. And sometimes, you know, they have the, all these uh, plants right there, the three prone thing. And then uh, the, in ancient Egypt, they either show eternity and abundance either this way or with a figure or uh, their god of, uh, of abundance like this. Either it's a three prone like this plant or it is the twisting rope. They all have the same meaning like eternity, infinity, and also abundance and you will see that it also expressed in this way uh, in in a lot of different cultures so I will take you back to ancient time and in this whatever time I have left now I will show you them how the patriarchal society spent thousands of years covering the matriarchal society uh, heritage so in the Chinese history we wrote this clearly that the ancient old only knew their mothers, not knowing their fathers. This is very uh, strong remnants of the matriarchal society. People only care about their mother, no one care about their father. And the other uh, uh, writing in ancient time is that the mother of our legendary first human or God stepped on a footprint of a super being and he got pregnant from that footprint and then gave birth to hay. Once again, the name is that. And if you go to um, pay attention to this hay and and if it's in Arabic as a, as I say again hay or haya or in Hebrew again the hay or hay always actually means the something related to the court 
to a rope or it means life a life or something related to God or, or it simply means something coming out from your mouth which is life itself and the other thing I want you to pay attention is the strange uh, uh, thing of the food keep coming up you know in this ancient writing it seems that since ancient time the food is a uh, uh, very, very subtle uh, reference to the uh, reproductive part, both of men and women. And then and women in Hebrew and in Arabic, uh, the food itself, sometimes it refers to the men too, either the men or the productive part, you know. So, and again, you will see that the women already disappeared because they only pointed to the men. But uh, basically, in the reproductive part, it points to both men and women. So you will see that there is a lot of veneration of the feet. Even as late as the, late, the later Buddhism or the Hinduism, you will see that the footprint again and again appears. And also, um, uh, as you know, Jesus will wash the feet of their, his disciple. And also in Hindu, it's very, very very common to wash the feet of the of the the, the people who's going to wed, uh, going into a wedding. I mean, so uh, a lot of things actually left in remnants in different cultures. And as a Chinese, I will tell you what I knew as a ch as a child. Um, uh, more than I mean, fifty something years ago, you know, when I was a little child, I remember that there's always a basin in the house that we know that we call it the feet washing basin. But this basin, we understood it very well that it's not just to wash the feet, it's to wash the private parts. Because at that time, not many people have a bathroom. So this basin is never to be confused with the basin to wash the face. To wash the feet means also the basin to wash your private parts. And um, for interesting reason, you know, this is always a typical part of a Chinese Taoi. And then it's always carry a sexual intonation, even when I was a child. And then if you go to some antique shop now, you might still find some, you know, high legged um, dowie basin. This is the feet washing basin. Of course, you are supposed to sit on it to wash your private part on your wedding night, you know. So uh, they are built, you know, high upright like that. And now you don't really find it. Now, if you go into, uh, you Google them, you will still find some Chinese dowie uh, package like this. But no one, if you ask a Chinese, the young generation, they don't seem to understand what these are for. But because it passed on from generation to generation, they always know that the pair of shoes were always put inside a basin and carry from the bridegroom to the, to, to the bride's house as a, as, as, a, as, 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 I mean, I'm sorry, the other way around, from the bride's house to the bridegroom's house, you know, as a dowry package, you know, and, and as you search more and more, you will see that, you know, they will actually tell you that it's a face a wash face basin but I can tell you that definitely it is not it is always to wash the feet never the face and then the the shoes is always right there because it has a connotation of the the, the, the food itself and in Chinese also wearing someone's old shoes has a very very bad connotation when you say someone is wearing someone's old shoes that means you are marrying someone's widow or or, or or something forbidden at that time. Of course, time has changed. And then, but if you look at those into the, um, Bible itself, you will find something very, very interesting. Uh, sometimes a scholar call it the shoe covenant. You will find it in Deuteronomy uh, 25.9 and 10. You will see that, you know, one of the custom is the, for the uh, people to uh, to finish a transaction, is to take the sandal off, you know, and give it to the other side. And then in Ruth 4.7 and 10, this is even a more interesting paragraph. It shows the, how a redeemer, uh, you know, <coughs> of, of, of a, a tribe is to finish the transaction of taking over a widow of another man, you know, to carry on the line. Um, for that, you know, it's like wearing someone's old shoes. I don't understand, 
I don't know why, you know, the Chinese actually have this very, very strong in our culture. I remember when I was a child, my father died very, very uh, early when I was nine years old. I heard those again and again. People were gossiping a lot, uh, forbidding my mother to let someone wear the old shoes of my father. So um, this is actually a very, very forbidden part in a Chinese culture as well. Of course, now, you know, the new generation don't understand it. But when I read this part of the uh, Bible itself, I think, wow, this is very interesting. It seems that the Chinese and the ancient Hebrews shared very, very similar culture. But everything is actually being hidden. And I will show you now how the female lineage, the matriarchal society, was stolen by the patriarchal society. And you will see again, you know, I will show you all this with the H, you know, writing. And then how the uh, beginning, you know, uh, God gave Sarah the line itself instead of the the I, you know, it was represented by H. Sarah changes name, Abraham changes name. The thread is forcefully put inside their name. And Rebecca and also Rachel. Rachel is even more interesting. If you read the Bible, the history of Bible, I mean the history of, of, of Rachel itself, Rachel actually carry a very, very strong thread. This thread is actually links to the whole tribe of Israel. But it was only after Rachel that the whole uh, patriarchal society took over completely. I will go into this in detail in another time, but I want to show you quickly that Again, when this happened in the Jewish culture happened, the Chinese culture happened at the same time, and also the Greek culture happened, the male actually took over everything. Uh, if you look at the Greek culture, you will pay attention to this, as I said. You will see the goddess Hera, the mother goddess, was actually the goddess who Take, who pay attention, who take care of the family, the marriage, and also the, the threat of the childbirth. And then um, you will see the hero. For a long time, I keep wondering why the hero was so important, what was the root of hero. But I finally find out the main thing that made up a hero was that he was definitely linked to God. You do not call anyone hero just by the courage. A hero becomes a hero only because it was born of a goddess. Half of the, the mother is the goddess. And then even paradise at that time is linked to God. You know, whoever has a mother or father as God is actually can go to that paradise, the Elysium itself. So uh, nothing was free. Everything is about blood uh, line. Everything is about, you know, whether you're linked to God. But at that time, you know, it's very, very important that you are linked to the goddess itself. And actually, gradually, as you can see, Hera herself was described as a very jealous wife. And Zeus took over. And from that time on, you know, uh, God became more important.